Each of us have been called to champion the dream. We all know that Dr. King was taken from this world in his human form in 1968, but he certainly left the legacy that I just talked about. He certainly left us a blueprint about how we should move throughout this world, this community, and this country. And clearly, as you look around, our work has not yet been done, but we do have a clear vision, and part of that vision is about giving our humanity to each other. No matter what you might think about what transpired in November and what is transpiring today, I would argue in just true advertising, I am a glass half full kind of girl. So no matter what, I'm gonna find something good about what's transpiring. And the thing that I find that's interesting is that people are now going out of their way to be nicer to each other. People are talking about our humanity. People are talking about having a conversation, coalescing, being, a being of one mind. And we all now are far more engaged than we were a year ago, two years ago, four years ago. So here's a real opportunity that if you consider yourself a leader in the seat that you're sitting in today, here's an opportunity to assert your leadership and to assert your vision and to bring other people along. One of the things that Dr. King reminded us about is that silence is an enemy. Silence is an enemy. You are just as at fault if you are silent and do nothing as those that might be transgressing. So if you have a different passion in your heart about what you see going on around you, it's now, it's now is the opportunity to bring people along with you and to put forth a new vision. And it is as simply as doing it. I will never forget, my former pastor said one Sunday, God expects you to go out and have an extraordinary life. And I remember sitting in that pew saying, what if it's that easy? What if it's just, I just need to decide that I will have an extraordinary life. And in that moment, in that decision, I decided that's what I was going to do. So however I defined extraordinary, I was going to go for it. I had the privilege and honor of speaking to some of your colleagues a few minutes earlier. And one of the things that I told them is that whenever you are at a decision point and you're not sure whether or not you should go forward and you're trying to make that decision, always default to the try. Always try it, no matter what. You have absolutely nothing to lose. Every time you go forward in trying something, you gain the experience. And the experience will give you one or two things. It will give you the blessing or the lesson. Either you get that thing that you were going for, or now you get a lesson about how to do it more successfully the next time around. You already know what no looks like, so why not play for yes? It's always worth going for it. As you heard from Dr. Frisco, I had the privilege of writing two books. And the reason, frankly, that I wrote the first one, Expect to Win, is that when I sat in your seats as an undergraduate, A, I wasn't really sure that I would even pursue a Wall Street career, and I certainly did not have a playbook around how to be successful if I were to do that. And of course, when I went on to Wall Street, I bought this whole concept of a meritocracy. Success is merely a function of how smart you are and how hard you work. Yet, when I started out my career, it didn't quite work out that way. You see, I thought I was pretty smart. As you heard, magna cum laude, Harvard undergrad, second year honors, Harvard Business School, pretty smart, huh? <laughs> I'm from the South, so I knew there were very few boys in this Northeast that could outwork me. Yet, that combination of working hard and being smart did not equal my success. So I had to ask myself, what's missing in this success equation? And that's frankly what the pearls, as I like to call them, Carlos pearls are all about. What are some of those other things that really inform your success equation? So as I close, I wanna give you three of those pearls this morning. The first one is, you cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. You will need other people's relationships in order to maximize your success. So I know sometimes it always feels easier to just quote, put your head down and work hard and you think you'll get there but you will need other people's relationships in order to maximize your success. And as I said earlier, the easiest way to grow your power is to give it away. So use your intellect, your influence on someone else's behalf. But whatever you do, engage. Engage in the relationships because you will need them in order to maximize your success. 
And oh, by the way, it's other relationships that will allow you to make an outsized contribution in your community to make a difference. Because as one man or one woman, if all roads lead back to you, you will cap your success. But if you can connect to other people, you can amplify and multiply your impact. And when you're in your career, the three relationships that I write about and expect to win is the advisor, the mentor, and the sponsor. The advisor is anybody in your environment that can answer a discreet question for you. Oh, I'm going on this assignment. What assignment do I need next in order to get promoted? Oh, can you introduce me to Tom? I'm going to work with him on a project. I'd like to get to know him before we start this project. Those are examples of discreet questions. And you can ask anybody in your environment that has the intellect and the experience to answer those questions. The mentor, on the other hand, is always the person that you can tell the good, the bad, and the ugly to. So by definition, it needs to, buy, it needs to be somebody that you trust <laughs> and somebody that knows you very well. Because a mentor's job is to give you tailored advice, tailored specifically to you and to your career aspirations. If I know Henry and I know Harold and they both want to be vice presidents and I'm a good mentor, I will give them two different strategies because they are two different men. And my job is to give them tailored advice that they can successfully execute. Now the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, you can survive a very long time in your career without a mentor, but you will not ascend in any organization without a sponsor. The sponsor is the most important of the three relationships. And the sponsor is the person in your work environment that is carrying your paper into the room. This is the person that behind closed doors will argue passionately on your behalf as to why you should get promoted, why you should get the next great opportunity, or why you should get the great bonus. Make no mistake, this is the person that is spending their capital on your behalf. The second pearl that I wanna leave you with is if you consider yourself a leader in the 21st century, you must be comfortable taking risks. You must be comfortable taking risks. 15 years ago, you could create a competitive differential for yourself if you had information that other people didn't have. But today, information is a commodity. So the way that you differentiate yourself in any environment <coughs> is to show that you're comfortable taking risks because it says to the marketplace that you're comfortable with change. And change is one guarantee that you will have in your life. Now, interestingly enough, people will say when we get in tough economic environments, keep your head down, keep your head down, don't rock the boat, don't shake it up. You know, 8% unemployment, now 5% unemployment. We're having another reduction in force. They're laying off people. But I will tell you that keeping your head down will not keep you from getting tapped for one of those occurrences. You might as well keep your head up so you can see that bullet coming. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> the reason why I said you can't keep your head down is because when you keep your head down, you submerge your voice. And as Dr. King taught us, your voice is at the heart of your power. When you submerge your voice, you become irrelevant. And when you become irrelevant, you put a big target on the front and a big target on the back. Especially during tough times, you should assert your voice. If you're in a work environment, you should say, oh, I know that we're trying to preserve costs. I have two <coughs> thoughts about why we should do that. Here's a group of people that are not being treated fairly. Let me give you the thoughts around why it's our, to our benefit to make sure that we treat them in a different way. Always assert your voice. Take that risk. And when I ask myself why we don't take more risks, the only thing I can come up with is that we're scared. We're just scared. It's fear. And ladies and gentlemen, hear me clearly. Fear has no place in your success equation. Fear has no place in your success equation. Anytime you approach anything in your life from a position of fear, personally or professionally, you will always underpenetrate that opportunity. And anytime I feel it creeping up the back of my neck, I just remind myself of that old Southern saying, fear is just false evidence of things appearing real. It's really not there. Because what's the worst that can happen if you take a risk and it doesn't work out? So you fail, but guess what? Failure always brings you a gift. And that gift is called experience. Now you know how to do it better. Now you know how to do it differently. Now you know how to do it successfully. 
at the margin, it is always worth taking the risk. And if you are faced with a new opportunity and you're not sure if you should take a risk on a new opportunity, ask yourself three questions. Will the new thing give you skills and experiences that you would not get if you stayed in that same seat another 12 months? Second question, will that new thing expose you to people, relationships, or networks that you would not get if you stayed in that current seat another 12 months? Last question, will that new thing create new branches on your personal decision tree of opportunity, i.e. you could go off and do some other things that you wouldn't have been able to do if you stayed in your current seat another 12 months? If the answer to all three of those questions is yes, you should absolutely take the risk. And as I close, the last pearl I leave you with is your authenticity is at the heart of your power. Nobody can be you the way that you can be you. It is your distinct competitive advantage. And any time that you try to speak or behave in a way that is inauthentic to who you really are, you will create a competitive disadvantage for yourself because you're using valuable intellectual capacity that you could really hear what that other person is saying yet is not articulating. Valuable intellectual capacity that you could use to demonstrate a quick twitch response. Valuable intellectual capacity that you could use to co-create with that other person that's on the other side of that conversation. I will tell you that most people are not comfortable in their own skin. So when they see someone who is comfortable and confident in their own skin, they will gravitate towards you. They want some of that. Dr. King did not go forward without fear. Of course he had fear. He was human. But at the end of the day, he brought all of who he was to the table and therefore attracted other people to come with him because he brought his authentic self and his authentic idea. I will tell you that that was an interesting lesson for me to learn when I first started in my job with Wall Street. As you heard, I am a singer. I've done three gospel CDs and five sold out concerts at Carnegie Hall. But when I started on Wall Street, I didn't want anybody to talk about the fact that I was a singer. I wanted to be known as a no nonsense, hard driving, analytical, quantitative investment banker. I'm not here to sing and dance, boys. Let's not get it twisted. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to talk about that until I saw the client reaction. My colleagues would take me to a pitch and say, oh, this is Carla Harris, our capital markets banker. The one you really ought to know about Carla. She's an amazing gospel singer. She sang at Carnegie Hall, the Apollo, et cetera. And I'm there rolling my eyes until I saw that client reaction. Oh, you're a singer. Oh, I so admire people who can sing. And I personally love to sing, but my family will only let me sing in the shower. And maybe you can talk to my daughter about how she integrates her love of art and her academics. And there we were, having a 15-minute meeting before the meeting. Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? The meeting before the meeting. So when I sat down to pitch my idea, they heard me with a different ear. They saw me through a different lens because Carla Harris, the singer, was allowed to be in the room with Carla Harris, the banker. I naturally differentiated myself from the other five bankers that would come in there and pitch that same IPO that afternoon. So now, whenever I go into a new situation, I bring Carla Harris, the investment banker. I bring Carla Harris, the prayer warrior. I bring Carla Harris, the investment manager. Carla Harris, the singer. Carla Harris, the writer. Carla Harris, the speaker. Carla Harris, the golfer. Carla Harris, the football fan. I bring all those Carlas to the table because I don't know which Carl will be the one that will connect and will allow me to own that relationship in a proprietary way. Your authenticity is at the heart of your power, and if you want to be a leader, it is imperative that you bring your authentic self to the table. And as I close, if we are to continue to be champions of the dream, we need four things, ladies and gentlemen. You need the courage, the courage to speak when you see an inequity, the courage to call it out, the courage to actually go forward and use your resources to help someone. We need the commitment to stick to it. It is not something that happens in good times or when things are really in the valley. You also need the consistency and you need to have the character because when you bring the best you to the table, that is what inspires people to follow you, as we saw with the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And with that, again, I say thank you, thank you, thank you.